So I'm sure that we all know that when steel, or I guess metals in general, when they get hot, they expand, and when they cool down, they contract. And that's the reason why the traditional style railways needed expansion joints to link up each sleeper. Without them, the thermal expansion during a hot day could cause the track to buckle. And I'm sure most of you did that experiment in high school science class where you get a steel ball and a ring that's almost the same size, and at room temperature, the ball can easily fit through, but as you heat it up, the ball expands and it doesn't fit through anymore. And that's all down to thermal expansion. And the thing is, we know the thermal expansion of steel quite well, and it's relatively linear. Except for this weird dip between about 730 and 800 degrees Celsius. And the thing is, this seems to be a very unusual property for a material. It's not unique by any means, it does happen to zirconia too, but by and large, it seems to be a real outlier when you compare it to other metals. And instead of just trying to look at the graph and explain it, I wanted to try and replicate it in the real world using the old ball and ring experiment. First step then was to make the ball. So I got my ball turner, and then I turned down a ball from some 1045 rod stock. I'm going to make it slightly oversized so I can then sand it down to the correct size. I can then make up a handle from some oak. I'll definitely be needing one since I will be heating the ball up. With the ball and handle now made, I'll now get a hole made in a piece of steel plate. I'm going to be using an annular cutter here, which should get me a hole near enough to 25mm. The exact size doesn't need to be spot on, since I will be sanding the ball down to the correct size. And that's our ball and a stick and piece of plate made up. The next step is to get the ball heated up so we can check on the gap as it heats up. Now I know this fit needs to be roughly 24.8mm for this to work, however there is a bit of a grey area because the bottom of the sphere is flat and there is a fair amount of metal that's been drilled out for the threads. So I will be doing this bit by bit to get the right size. As you can see from this first run, the ball has already expanded too much and we're nowhere near 730 degrees. At this point I need to cool it down, take it back to the lathe and sand it down a little bit more and then try again. I only have about 0.1mm to work with, so I need to keep the sanding as light as possible. And in fact, that's going to be the real challenge here, because I can't really measure it when it's at room temp. I need to first heat it up to get it to expand, and then I can start to measure it. The next problem was, how exactly do I measure the temperature? Because most thermal guns max out at about 600 degrees, at least most of the reasonably priced ones. So what I'm doing here is I'm using the glow of the steel as a rough guide. The colour of the steel will indicate its temperature, and we do have a small temperature window to get this correct, you know, about 100 degrees. And the colour that I'm going for is a very, very dull red, and as you'll see, it was very difficult for me to capture that on video. It's also important that the ball doesn't heat up the metal plate and cause it to expand as I'm checking for the fit. I also mentioned that it was important not to take too much metal off when sanding, which is exactly what I did here, and as a result, I had to restart. I promise you, this was not an easy or a fast thing to do. In fact, it took about 30 shots and two canisters of gas to get this right. But on the 30th take, here's what happened. The ball was heated to a dark red, which is on the lower end in terms of heat, and as I put the ball in the ring, the ball catches and it doesn't want to go all the way in. However, after a bit more heating, which I've sped up, when I go to push it back in, 
It binds ever so slightly, but the ball does go all the way in. Now, I do want to point out that I was making sure to apply the same amount of force both times, and I was trying to be quick with this since I don't want the ring to heat up from the contact with the metal and expand. Now, obviously, I do realize I'm no scientist, and I know there would have been better ways of doing this. You know, especially trying to keep the plate consistent and knowing the exact temperature of the ball would have gone a long way. So let me back this up with a theory and answer the question, why does steel shrink at 730 degrees? Well, the answer is partially to do with heat, but it has nothing to do with thermal expansion or contraction. It's all down to the phases of steel. I previously talked about how steel has an internal microstructure. In a normal piece of steel, the iron atoms will form what is called a body-centered cubic structure or system. Now the specifics are not that important, but it does describe how each iron atom is positioned relative to the next one. And importantly, all of the iron atoms will form this structure throughout the piece of steel. Now as we start to heat up the metal, the molecules that make it up will start to vibrate and they'll physically start to take up more and more space. And that's the expansion that we see that's due to heat. However, at over 730 degrees, something else starts to happen. The internal microstructure of the steel you know, the atoms themselves, start to rearrange. Now, the exact point that this occurs will depend on the amount of carbon, but at some point, the ferrite and the perlite will transform into something called austenite. And the way that the iron atoms are arranged will start to shift, going from something called body-centered cubic to face-centered cubic. Now, the specific details are not hugely important, and it may not look like a huge change if you look at a diagram, but this arrangement of the iron atoms is denser, or at least closer packed in. However, this change in density is larger than the change that's caused by the thermal expansion, and that explains the dip that we saw in the graph. And that accounts for the shrinkage that we see on the ball. However, it should be noted that the thermal expansion will continue, so if we kept on heating the ball, it would eventually get stuck again, which is why I only had about 100 degrees to get this correct. Another consequence of this high temperature shrinkage is that it can play a big role in why oil and water quenched steel is so susceptible to cracking and warping. If you look at how steel contracts as it cools down, you'll see that after lagging for a little bit at high temperatures, the steel follows the same path back down to room temperature, and it should end up being the same size as we started off. However, this is only true for annealed steel, or steel that's been left to cool down very slowly. However, for steel that's been quenched in oil or water, it's going to see a rapid contraction in the metal, but that's going to be followed by a sudden expansion at low temperatures, and that happens as the ferrite and the cementite, and I guess martensite, form out of the austenite. And it really doesn't help that this expansion is somewhat delayed. The newly formed steel is going to be incredibly brittle, and these physical expansions and contractions could very well cause it to crack. And at the very least, it will cause some of the internal stresses. And obviously, that's going to be best case scenario if it's cooled evenly. Uneven cooling will throw the stresses even further out of whack and contribute to the part warping. It also probably doesn't help a whole lot if the part has a lot of mass to it, because the outside will probably have cooled down, whilst the inside might be red hot. So the inside will be pushing and pulling as the outside has cooled down and hardened. And that's why oil quenching is going to be a bit better for delicate parts, because the rate of cooling is about a third for oil, and the expansion and the contraction swing is not as bad compared to water. However, if warping or cracking is really going to be a big issue, the better methods to cool it down would be to either use an air hardening steel, or the part could be os tempered. Effectively what you do here is you quench the part in molten salt at about 300 degrees, and then you let it slowly cool down to room temperature. The overall thermal shock is going to be far less, and the chance of it cracking or warping is going to be reduced. Although there are many other reasons why you would os temper a part. Alright, and that's about it for now. I really wasn't planning on taking this detour, but since I was already doing stuff on heat treating steel, I thought I might as well show this lesser known fact on steel. Thanks for watching.